What are some of the traits that characterize digital storage? Well, maybe the most prominent one is what I refer to as the digital footprint. And look, these are, are not universal, these words, the um, words I use. Yeah, many people call about digital trace data, and that makes a lot of sense too. I call it digital footprint because you inevitably leave it behind with every digital step you take. And even so, we got very used to that idea that you know, we get tracked and we get observed and we leave this footprint behind. It's still surprising to us. This is a video that is quite old, at least over 10 years old, and I invite you to watch it because it shows all of us are still getting surprised. It's kind of like a mind reader. If you think about, well, what does Alexa and Siri know about us? Or what, uh, what do the web services know about us? And what does the social network, what does this artificial intelligence know? We still get surprised by that. And we, if a mind reader would tell us so much about our lives, we would be blown off our feet. So it's, you know, it changes, it, it plays with the human psyche to a degree that even so it's been around for many, many years, this digital footprint idea, we still, it, has, it still hasn't sunk in to our psychology. Now, the digital footprint, you can really think about it as a, as a footprint. So this is, uh, this digital footprint I produce just by having my, my mobile phone in the pocket, and then you can go to Google Maps and you can just see where you have been in, in recent times around your town or around the globe. And you can also do interesting studies with that. So that's when somebody says, good morning on Twitter, and we can then learn something about society. For example, we can see that people on the East Coast, they get up a little earlier than us here in California. And that has not to do only with the time zone, no, really. Besides the time zone, we really sleep in more here on the West Coast. And no, nobody did us, nobody paid money to do this study. But with this observational data, you can learn a lot about how this superorganism that's called society behaves. And you can also zoom in from the macro to the micro. Here I zoomed into my digital footprint from the year 2000. 14 and it, it seems like I was all over Davis. So this is Davis. I have no idea what I did there and what I did there at downtown and there's the bar area and the restaurants and I didn't know, but you know, Google Maps will never forget. I forgot. So the digital footprint is right there. Now, once you have this data, you can learn a lot from it. And as, as the digital footprint is inevitably produced, you can then see like what data you have and what you can infer for it. For example, one information that has to be produced is the call duration and the call frequency. That's not a very sophisticated digital trace you leave behind. If you want to call somebody, you know, the, the telecommunications operator needs to connect you. And then in order also to bill you, well, nowadays it's often unlimited, but they still register when there is a call and how long the call goes. And that's all. They're not interested who you call. They're not interested in what you are saying. It's just the call, how long and when you make a call. And that alone, this digital footprint, allows you to reverse engineer an entire census up to 80, almost 90% accuracy, 85% accuracy. And that was many years ago. That was over decades ago that we were already able to do that. And a census, that's the census when people go door to door. All countries around the world do a census. It's a really thorough investigation of who's in the country. And we do it only every 10 years because it's so expensive. Now, with 85% accuracy, we can update that, you know, almost in real time with some very rudimentary data. Now, if you add more sophisticated data on top, guess what you can do? And the digital footprint obviously has increased a lot. There's content, there are things we say, there's much more that's being tracked. And we push that too, for example, with our smart homes. So we, we are we monitoring ourselves all the time. And there has been uh, this big controversy if our smart speakers, our Alexa, our series, our Hey Googles and so forth, if they are actually listening to us or not. And a colleague here from UC Davis and some other colleagues have shown that, yes, they're listening. And when you interact with these smart speakers, that is being used for marketing. In contrary, what some of these companies have claimed in the past. So that's why when you, you know, interact with the device and you speak in the kitchen, the next day you open the internet and suddenly you see some, hey, I just mentioned that yesterday to my partner. What is, it, what is this doing? Under, have you ever had that feeling? 
Okay? So we increasing this digital footprint and guess what? It can make much more power pre powerful predictions about us. By the way, you also leave a digital footprint behind when you study here. So now let me pull back the curtain and see what happens in the back office. Of course, the, all this interaction is registered as well, which helps me a lot. I mean, in some, some of the courses, I have thousands of students, 60,000 students have been taking one class and I can put it all together. And now I can analyze. And what I'm actually mostly concerned about, first of all, is the extremes, like which students I can motivate to get more engaged and which students are bored. And then I can also dive into the middle and if you know most of my viewers of my students watch me in double speed, which I think would be difficult because I'm speaking so fast anyways. Is there anybody who watches me in double speed? I have no idea. <laughs> I think I'm speaking so fast uh, that, but anyways, if, if many of you fast forward, then I can also see that and say like, well, that is probably on me now. If, if many of you watch the same content five or six times, then I probably haven't been clear. That's also on me. So you leave a digital footprint behind as well. I can see what you skip, what you don't skip, uh, and so forth. That gives me uh, important information. Now, this is not only on spying on people. This is also, it helps us to make large-scale predictions. There are some digital footprint produced not only by us walking and behaving, by, for example, this is a study from Rene Weber from University of California in Santa Barbara. And what they did, they analyzed news headlines. So that's also a digital footprint that is left behind. It's digital trace data. So news headlines are produced Anyways, that's just a digital trace. And then they had some machine learning, they called it the moral analyzer. And with that, they were able to predict some social movements, for example. Is there what's going on in the world? Can we predict social uprisings? Or can we predict some kind of protest? Can we help to mitigate? And is that information almost baked into these headlines, which are produced anyways? So often these digital footprint ideas is you look what's out there, Spoiler alert, uh, usually what you look for is not out there. There won't be a digital trace often about what you're exactly looking for, but you look to something. So here they were interested in social uprisings, for example, let's say that, and that information is not out there. But then you look for the best proxy indicator that is accidentally or not available in the digital footprint. And then you analyze that and then you correlate that and see like, okay, how much can they tell you about the thing that you're really interested in? And you could do the same thing if you want to create a new business model. Right? You want to do something, look what's out there. And then, well, that's why the big data companies, they just say, when in doubt, collect everything. And they do collect everything. Which brings me to the next point. And this next point, which I cryptically call small n equal big N, is basically the ambition of data companies that say, not when in doubt, just as default, collect everything. It's produced anyways, the digital footprint, so you just connect everything. And what this here means is that you don't need to sample. The sample, usually in statistics referred to as the small n, is equal to the universe. So the universe would be all people that are on a certain platform, for example, or all people that are in a country. And traditionally, I sample. I just make a survey of parts of them, and then I infer to all of them, I do statistical inference. Now, if I do a census, for example, as I just mentioned, then you try to ask both. And you ask all, and you survey all. So what the ambition is of data companies, they just say, like, don't even sample. There's no need for sampling. You just get what you get, and then you analyze that. That's interesting because a lot of the things that statistic is hinges on, that it's very important in statistic, like statistic, statistical significance doesn't matter anymore then. Statistical so significance is basically a measure of how reliable is your sample. But if you don't sample, you just got what you got. And with big data, everything is significant because you just have what you have. Is there a difference? Well, there is a difference because that's just what there is. There's not a sample that I infer to, to the universe of my data. Let me show you one example. So here, there's a study done many years ago in 2015 of this entrepreneur who founded a dating platform, OkCupid, okay, I don't even know if it's still around, but in, in 2010, there were 3.5 million active users on this platform. And then he wrote an interesting book about it and started to study, well, how do people actually search and find love? Isn't that amazing? The digital footprint can tell us about the most important things, actually, even 
what you put here in this graph is what's the age of a woman that I have here on the on the y-axis I have 20 year old women here 30 year old women 50 year old women and what's the age of the man who look best to her and you can see that by their you know by their behavior what they what they look at and you can see that uh, 20 year old women they like men who are a little bit more mature the 23 25 year old and you can see more experienced women here in the 40s they like the younger guys that are like in their late 30s so if it would be one to one it would be on the started line but it's kind of like a crossing diagonal younger women like a little bit more older uh, men and uh, and reverse later on. Now, how do you think this graph looks for men? Well, looks like this. Now, now that is, I don't know if it's funny or if it's to cry, but actually that's what he found, right? So to men, the age of the woman who looks best to him is always 20 years old. Now, you know, you could start a big discussion about now about it, why we have a 50% divorce rate and, and, and about evolution or, or, or why this is. And so and, and, and I don't know why it is. And you can then also derive big conclusions from that and say like, well, because all men are basically like, that's how men are. And it's because, and you, but the most important thing to remember is here that this is just digital footprint data. Now, is it all men are like this? And before you laugh or cry about this result, you know, that's what you have to ask yourself. Well, actually, it is all men that were on this dating platform in the year 2010. Well, it's 3.5 million. That's a lot. But that's certainly not a random sample. So this is there's certainly a bias with men who as early on in the online dating game in the year 2010 went to that platform. And that might bias your result. Can you therefore refer anything about your husband? Well, <laughs> I don't know what we just have to say when we do social science, and that's interesting. So the digital footprint teaches us a lot of things about the really fundamental important things in society, such as love as well, and, and, and how that actually works. And now we can, but what we have to make sure is that in many, in most digital footprint studies, there is no representative ram, random sampling going on. It is just a footprint. The small n, the sample, is equal to the big n, the universe. That's just who is on that platform at that time. And that's what you can say. So when you study all tweets on Twitter or all Facebook posts, then you can say that. Those are all Twitter users and all Facebook users. You cannot necessarily say Americans or this or that because it might or might not be. And most likely it's not representative. It's a biased sample provided by digital trace data. Another very important trait of digital storage is economy to scale. That is also I invite you to look back at the Shapiro Varian Information Rules book, which, which talk about that. And economies of scales are extremely important and have big implications for why we see the digital economy and digital reality is as it is. It, it contributes to why we have these mega corporations that are getting so big and so dominant because of economies of scale. Why is that? Well, what are economies of scale? Well, traditionally, if you produce some kind of product, some kind of thing, you have a fixed cost to produce it and you have a variable cost. So and if you want to produce a car, you first have to get, well, you have to get the manufacturing company, you have to buy some land to build actually you know, your company. Then you have to buy the conveyor belts, you have to buy the steel, you have to like, you have some fixed cost that you go in. And then if you produce one car, you have the variable cost. That's usually the labor that goes into it. Now, if you build a second car, the marginal cost, you create scale economics. So economies of scale is when you produce many of them, the variable, variable cost will go down. Now you still need the same amount of steel that goes into each car, the same amount of metal, but even some of your initial investment when you use, when you produce many cars, the average cost of your conveyor belt and of your company might be going down. So if you don't use your machinery full time, it's more expensive and you can, when you use it more efficiently, you can make use of scale economy. So you use the same machinery more efficiently. Now, but there's still some variable costs. It still costs something to produce one additional thing, the labor, for example, that goes into screwing that additional car together. Now, how does it work with digital products? Well, digital products, interestingly enough, are 100% fixed cost. 
there is no variable cost. Because once I produce a digital product, for example, a song or a software or a movie, if I want to create a second copy of it for somebody else to consume, what do I do? Well, right mouse button, copy paste, and that's it. So a digital product is very different than a physical product, an information product. And in, in, in information products, I can just copy paste. Now the cost can also be the time you invest into it to write and uh, or train an artificial intelligence. And that's why once you have an artificial intelligence, why, when one artificial intelligence, when chat GPT or when one recommender algorithm, the rec YouTube's recommender algorithm knows something, then I can just like copy paste the knowledge of that thing to another one. I don't have to retrain it again. So when one AI is able to recognize motorcycles versus cars, then I just copy paste it and can put it into other AI. So you can think about, well, it depends on the architecture and so forth, of the weights of the deep learning. But in general, you can think about that like this. So it can also be an artificial intelligence. And that's why these companies get so big because, well, network externality also play a role. And we will talk about that later on, how these actually combine. But you can see that it makes sense that you have an economic advantage when you sell it to many people. And nowadays it costs a billion dollars. A billion dollars is insane to create a video game. Now, if you sell it to a billion people, you can sell it, you know, one dollar a piece and you still recover your costs. So, because once this video game is created, you have to copy paste it a lot. Then it makes a lot of sense also here for, for online lectures, for example. In the future, they will be, they will be much more expensive because once they're once recorded, I'm aware and part of this dynamic too, right? Becomes copy paste and you can access and you can learn from the best. You can learn from teachers that are probably much better and explain it much better. And who have much better animations, like my little animations. In the future, hopefully, we will meet in the metaverse and then we have some 3D animations. And But that is expensive, so I don't have these resources. So here I'm working on my little slide deck. But in the future, you can then dive with me into this and it could cost a billion dollars to create a lecture. Well. As long as you copy paste it often enough, you can, you can get your money back. What I maybe find most fascinating on scale economies, as important as they have been, is that this is evolving and that's why I call them traits. So traits such as personality traits, you are agreeable or extroverted, but over a lifetime it can also change a little bit. It's, it's very stable usually, but it could, could change in a big life event, for example. And with a big technological innovation, also digital traits can change. Not very often and not very fast, but this idea of infinite economies of scale has been challenged most recently with the blockchain. And we already talked about it, it has to do with non-fungibility. So I'm not going to bore you about this, just going to link to this lecture. If you missed our lecture on the blockchain and on the metaverse and so forth, then but think about it. So what I just told you about economies of scale that you can infinitely copy paste, that is challenged by non-fungibility, by non-fungible tokens. For example, I can still make a copy, but there's only one original of the Mona Lisa. Now, there can be many pictures of the Mona Lisa, but now there is a value to the first one and unique one. And what they do here with these whatever board apes or whatever NFTs they are, they basically make little modifications that are also very cheap. I mean, you can just like give the monkey a pipe or not a pipe. And these have been sold for millions of dollars these little pictures, it's very cheap. Like the variable cost to produce the second one is like, it is there, it's, uh, but it's almost nothing. And then you have a, a second one. Now you can make infinite number of copies, but it not necessarily has the same value. So, and I also don't understand what the implications of this are. You wanna study it, but that is how technological innovations as well can challenge long-standing digital trades. And this is evolving. So the infinite economies of scales are now challenged while before, you could just copy paste music and nobody knew what was the copy, what was the original. With the increasing establishment of the blockchain, we can make a distinction there. And I also don't really understand yet the implications of that.